Whether you own one snare drum or a hundred snare drums, one of the biggest problems we run into is looking at a drum in front of us and trying to decide what the right sound is for that drum, whether it's in our heads or in a recording or something we can't even imagine. We have a fair amount of drums here at the studio. Some of them are mine, some are Ben's. And generally we use a Ludwig Superphonic because in terms of the industry, it's a very middle of the road sounding drum. But fortunately for us, we have a few other options here, which sometimes we look at and go, what would I do with that drum today if I wanted to use that one? The first thing that we want to get out of the way right now is a big elephant in the room, and that is that there's a tremendous amount of conversation about the actual construction and material of snare drums, when in reality, it's one of the least important factors in determining what that drum is capable of. Setting aside whether it's wood or metal, never ever forget that the heads, the wires, the bearing edge, and the actual dimensions of the drum factor in much more broadly than what the drum is made of, who made it, or how much it cost. The examples and experiments you're going to hear today straight up came from years of experimentation and learning about what drums are capable of, what certain drums excel at more than others, and how to train ourselves to be able to choose the right drum for a job while always understanding that every drum has a very wide tuning range and many usable, maybe even amazing sounds within it. For today's journey, we are going to do three different snare drums, two metal and one wood, and we are going to dig into how we select sounds that make sense for that drum's design and that get the most out of it in terms of the sounds that we're looking for. This is not about choosing the right sound for a certain musical context. This is strictly talking about the drum in front of you and optimizing that one so that if you want that sound, you can choose that drum. First drum up today is the Ludwig Acrolyte. Let's hear it, see where it's at. The Ludwig Acrolyte is a tried and true, time-tested instrument with, again, as we said before, for all of these, pretty wide tuning range. So why are we choosing to tune it this way? One of the hallmarks of this particular style of drum is very dry, articulate, punchy sound through the whole tuning range. This means that if we want to get a higher tuning that still has a good amount of body and punch to it, this is a really great selection. Additionally, this is a great drum for being very dynamic because the design affords us a lot of sensitivity, even at a very high tuning range, and still opens up and gives us a big fat rim shot if we want that as well. This is a great choice for a lot of scenarios, but particularly anytime you want to make sure you have a lot of beautiful tone in the drum while still tuning it up very high, where some other drums might start to thin out at this tension. Other choices that we made very intentionally are single ply 10 mil G1 coated batter head and a standard 300 snare side so that we're dealing with not a ton of mass because again, this is a thin aluminum shell, so we don't want to choke the shell out with a ton of mass from the heads. Now with this particular drum, we could take the alternate track and go against this grain and maybe put a very heavy or self-muffling batter head on it, tune it way down and even throw a bunch of tape on it, which is about as far from this as you could possibly get. The fact of the matter is, this drum does that great as well. A lot of drums do that great, but never forget that just because this sounds good this way, 
doesn't mean that it doesn't have a hundred other really cool sounds in it that might be useful in a different context or inspire you in a different way. It's important to note that you don't need to know every single detail of the specs and design of the instrument that you're using. Most of the ones that really count are visually available to us, such as eight lugs, triple flange hoops, shallow depth. We can look at the width of the snare wires. We can check what heads are on it. The thickness of the shell, things like that, those aren't the front runner pieces of information. It's more about things we can see, we can adjust, and maybe even change out if we want to. Next up, Snare drum number two, our Pearl Masters Custom. This drum, again, also has a pretty wide tuning range. I love it in the mid to mid high. It really just makes a beautiful barking, punchy sound. It makes me think of pop music, rock music, every 90s record that I really like, apart from the ones with the cranked piccolo, obviously. And this drum differs in several ways from the last, which led us to this choice. While the sound we settled on is quite cracking and feels pretty high and crispy, this is tuned significantly lower than the Acrolyte was. Some of the differences that are affording this for us here are that the hoops in this case are die cast, which are much stiffer and give a more aggressive rim shot pretty much all the time. We are also using 10 lugs on this drum rather than eight, which changes the way that we tune it and the way that the tension is distributed, which again, changes the behavior of the whole instrument. The bearing edges on this drum are also a bit sharper and the point is closer to the edge of the drum than the previous one, which affords us a little bit crispier articulation and faster response at a slightly lower tuning, which allows us to get this sound. Because of all of the things that I just mentioned, we decided to go with a 12 mil coated G12 on this drum instead of the 10 mil with the previous because everything about this drum is affording us the opportunity to put more mass on there, which gets a little bit more powerful of a sound and loves a slightly lower tuning. This leans in pretty directly into the darker, clangier tonality of the die cast hoops. But at the same time, we are also using essentially the same depth of drum right now. So the dimensions actually haven't changed. Now, if you're listening to this and you feel like you're hearing a huge difference and your brain is going directly to the idea that this is a wood drum and the last one was metal, please let me reiterate that the material that the shell is made out of, it does affect things, but it is down on the totem pole from everything else that we're talking about here. And additionally, all the other things we're talking about, heads, hoops, wires, etc., those are interchangeable. So if the shell of the drum is sound, don't worry about buying another drum for the first thing. Consider the possibility of changing heads, hoops, wires, or some combination of those. Anecdotally, just as an aside, this drum, when I hit it, I feel like it's telling me to hit it harder and harder and harder. That's harder to quantify, but it's important to note that some drums beyond what they physically are, they inspire you to play differently. And that is not a thing to leave on the cutting room floor. If a drum inspires you to play a certain way, that's another part of it to keep in mind for when you're going for a certain sound, because that energy and that feeling, that's a big part of it. This drum in particular doesn't actually belong to me. It's Ben's, it lives at the studio, but I've been playing it several times a week for almost six years now. So I know it as if it is my own. And over that course of time, I've put every imaginable sort of drum head combination on there, bizarre snare wires, normal snare wires, classical snare wires. We've tuned it 
every possible way you could imagine with every sort of muffling ever. And what that gives me is just a huge Rolodex of knowledge about what this drum is capable of with all of these different methodologies and personal prescriptions that I've come up with to get it to do certain things. That doesn't invalidate any one of those sounds. It's actually the opposite. It's not that it's a jack of all trades and master of none. We want every drum in our arsenal of options to be this versatile, but the versatility is in us. It's not just in the drum. We have to know these things, take the time, experiment, and learn inside so that you know what to do when you get to the drum. Now, for the elephant in the room, the big nickel over brass D-drum Vintone. Now when I say big, I'm not just talking dimensionally. The sound that this drum is capable of, depending on how you set it up, is massive. It's so much fun, and this has been one of my favorites to experiment on here in the shop because it's capable of a lot more than you would think from looking at it, and it also has some idiosyncrasies that make it exciting. For this drum, we went in the direction that just looking at it at a distance seemed to make sense. It's eight lugs, it's very deep, it has triple flange hoops on it, it's a just beautiful, straightforward, simple drum. It's telling me that we want to tune it low and big, put some muffling on there, and see just how broad of a sound we can get. The fact of the matter is, we have also tuned this drum very high, and it works amazingly in that context because of how it's designed, not in spite of it. Taking an instrument that gives you one idea when you see it and going as far from that as you possibly can is never a bad idea. This is how we learn. The experimentation is the whole bag here, guys. You got to make sure that everything in that drum, you dig into it and figure out what it can do. The fun thing about this kind of tuning also is that it boxes you in a little bit because your ghost notes aren't really going to do a whole lot. Playing softly doesn't sound really great. I treat it more like a sample, which is another thing that comes from experience. If someone hands you this drum and you've never played one that's set up like this, which is to say, I can press the batter head in with my fingers. It's very low. It feels crazy. It feels like a pillow. So. The experience of tuning and adjusting the instrument in conjunction with the experience of playing instruments that are set up in unusual and unexpected ways all brings us around to being more musical and more versatile in the end. Through the aforementioned experimentation, we've learned about this drum that it really benefits from a thinner and somewhat stiffer head. So we chose a UV1 for this setup, knowing that we were going to be muffling it very aggressively. We chose this as opposed to a pre-muffled or double ply head to avoid the possibility of choking the drum out, which is actually something that can happen at very, very low tunings too. I think often players and people studying this stuff think that choking has to do with too much tension, but there's another version of it at very low tunings that can be avoided by making sure that the head itself doesn't have too much mass, and then we add mass around the edge to get the kind of booming, low, thumping sound that we're looking for. Sometimes that mass is an E-ring, sometimes that mass is a wallet. Today it's gaff tape and like half a box of napkins. The world is your oyster too, do whatever you want. But make sure that you pay attention while you're doing it so that if you love it, you can do it again. All right, we've heard three very different drums tuned and prepared in three very different ways. What is the takeaway here? Every drum you have has a hundred drums inside of it. And the more time you spend learning about each of those nuanced options that we find through tuning and heads and wires and a general sense of musicality and, and ideas in our heads, 
the better we can be at finding sounds that make us happy, recreating those sounds and staying inspired rather than diving into gear acquisition syndrome and thinking that every drum is one sound. I remember being younger and thinking that way and also thinking that my heroes all had lots of snare drums, so surely I should also have lots of snare drums. And I don't anymore because for me, it's a lot more fun to figure out what each one of them is capable of and get to know it like a friend and then take that friend with you to play music, be creative and have fun and grow and change together. This all comes back to experimentation and paying attention to what happens while you're doing it. Finding a sound that you don't love right out of the gate is okay, it's not a failure. You may love that sound down the road someday. All experience is positive experience when it comes to these kinds of things. So remember, experiment, pay attention to what you did, and consider the possibility that a sound you don't love today might be your absolute favorite a couple years down the road. 